made sense if any of you saw the movie, which I'm hoping most of you had. Anyone here not seen Schindler's List? Raise your hands if you've never, if you did not see it. Okay, so, all right, let's, let's get these. There is one incredible scene in that film where, if you remember, the encounter between Schindler, the ultimate con man who God uses to do good in a time of incredible evil, and the commandant of the concentration camp, who is the sick, perverted, demented soul who took incredible pleasure in not only the murder of the, the inmates, but also the torture of them, as well as the murder. And they're at the home, and he's cutting a deal for this mythological factory that Schindler's going to come out. And the commandant's going through the grounds. And every once in a while, for no reason whatsoever, he'll just take out his gun, put the gun to a head of, a, of, of one of the Jewish prisoners, and just shoot him dead, right on the spot. And he says to Schindler, this is real power. Real power is when you have, you have the power to shoot them if you want to. And Schindler, trying to make some good come out of evil, and because he's the consummate con man, says to him, no, nah, no, he's trying to stop the evil in his own kind of strange way. He says, real power is if you have the power to shoot them anytime you want, but you don't. That's power. Sharon's shaking her head, you remember the scene. Yeah. We're told by all the accounts of scripture that Jesus began his ministry in this public act of acclamation where he's baptized and then filled with what the scripture said, God's spirit, he's driven out into the desert. And he's going to be tempted. And the question that's going to be put before him is what kind of power are you going to exercise? Who are you? You've been told in a voice, you are my chosen one, my beloved, you are God's son. Well, think about it. Jesus as man. The first man, the Adam, he was tested, he was and he failed. Well, the second Adam did the same thing. You're God's son, what kind of sonship are you going to establish? How are you going to restore the image of God? What methods are you going to choose? What kind of power? So I know this is the worst possible and most ridiculous day to ask you to do this, but I want you to use your imagination and think of being born. Okay? <laughs> I want you to go out and imagine the area south-southwest of Jerusalem in, in an area that's about 35 miles by 15 miles. It's called the wilderness, in the temptation. In Hebrew, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. It's called the Jeshimon. And it is a place of horror. It is desert. It is desolate heat as you are heading down the slopes towards the Dead Sea. If you've seen any of those shows on uh, National Geographic, the Dead Sea, the one body of water on our planet that has no life whatsoever, not even bacteria. Nothing lives there. It is liquid death. And in that area, we are told that the hills are almost like dust heaps. The limestone is white, it looks blistered, it's so hot. The rocks look bare and jagged, the ground sounds hollow under your feet, and the place with the rocks just glows like a furnace. That's how hot and awful this place is. And I remember, because I love these travel shows and whatnot, but they read, read a diary from somebody who was either an archaeologist assistant or somebody who's actually visiting the area, who did not purport to be very religious. And this person wrote in his diary, having been in that area, I don't know if I believe in God, but I do believe in devil. <laughs> having walked through it's a lonely place to wrestle with evil. And the question was, how are you going to win us back? How are we going to make sense out of humankind that is so hell-bent on destructing itself? So the scripture tells us Jesus faced three temptations. And the temptations all come down to this. Leave the way of the servant. Don't do it that way. Don't do what your father wants you to do. Use your power. Be a miracle worker and take care of yourself. Feed yourself. Or use your power for political gain so you can protect yourself. Or use your power for spectacular stunts and call attention to yourself. Yet you all told about us, isn't it? When all is said and done, they all say the same thing. Don't listen to the voice of God. Don't follow the way you're supposed to walk. Follow the way of the first Adam. Serve yourself. Eat from the tree of knowledge and do it the easy way. The real power is never about doing anything. It's not always about doing it my way. Real power is about service. Serving our sisters and brothers, loving those who are the, the unlovable in our lives. 
Real power is modeled on how we are as a man and woman, living as others watching us, taking the good news of God seriously, and touching the lives of others in any way we can. It is exercised in self-sacrifice and humility. Real power for Jesus, if you play off against Adam, Adam reaches for the wood of a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus reaches for the wood of a different tree, it's the wood of the cross. And only a life that is poured out in love and service as his was, is ultimately going to lead to life. So what does that all mean to us here? It's not the desert, it's not 116 degrees out there. You might wish it is by the time we walk outside again. What I'm asking you to consider are the next 40 days. To think about this incredibly precious, important time to renew within yourselves the power that was given to you the day you were baptized. Paul writes to the Christians in Rome, if you confess on your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you memorize nothing in all scripture, if you knew nothing in all scripture, if you just knew that one line of his and took it to heart and lived it, you would glow with the same type of light that, for those of you who were here last week, which we used trying to show the young people that the glow of Christ's love can be seen by others. Lent is a time to renew our convictions. It's a time to renew ourselves. It's a time to get rid of the garbage, the stuff that gets between you and God, the stuff that screws up relationships with others. I'm going to take a chance on this, okay? Valentine's Day, right? How many of you have turned to the person that you wake up with each morning and tell that person, I do care about you? And how many of you will do it tomorrow? But it's not Valentine's Day. Okay. That was a parenthetical question. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for sharing. <laughs> Be proud of it. Okay. We are told that we need to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead. That is what being a Christian ultimately is about. All right? It believes that not only that Jesus lived, but that he lives. And if there's one thing, and you're going to see me pray for and pray over three, in my humble opinion, three rather extraordinary and three young people I dearly care about. If they get anything out of the weeks they have spent with me, the weeks they're going to continue to spend with me, I want them to know that it's not only knowing about Christ, it's knowing Christ, and there's a difference. It's about a relationship with God. So you've got 40 days, 40 days to perhaps spend a little bit more time in prayer, a little kinder to the people you live with. Take some time reading the scripture. Acknowledge owning your sinfulness. Take ownership of it and do something with it. Get rid of it and realize you are loved and forgiven. Doing for others as Christ the servant does for us. It's time to stare down the temptations we deal with day after day. So after his baptism, Jesus went into the desert and began his 40 days. And right now, it may not be the desert.